All right. Hello, doctors and friends, and welcome to the Doc Tales podcast. As always, we are recording this podcast from the Hardcast Media Studios at the historic Heinrich House Museum in DuPont Circle, downtown Washington, D.C. And thankfully, uh, the heating system is working well today because uh, winter is coming. It is here. And I am extremely excited uh, to be joined by one of the most interesting and inspirational physicians I've ever met in this area, Dr. Anthony Mark. <laughs> How are you today, my friend? Um, doing well. Uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. I don't know if I'm interesting and inspirational, but I am definitely a person that's here. Well, you've got about an hour to prove it. All so, right, here we uh, go. Well, I really can't thank you enough because you're coming from Quantico, Virginia. You were literally just finishing up surgeries at Fort Belvoir, wrapping them up in order to get here in time. So I really can't thank you enough. That, that really means a lot to me. Um, and unfortunately, uh, your lovely wife, Regina, she couldn't join us today. Um, but I know you can't really accomplish anything you've done so far without her. I've had the pleasure of meeting her many times. And oh, she, yeah. She's really amazing. Also, uh, happy belated birthday to your little one-year-old who just turned one on uh, November 2nd, right? That's right. That might be part of the reason Regina can't come. I'm guessing those one-year-olds yeah. don't take care of themselves. No, they're not as independent as you would like. You know, we set food out for her, and even still, we have to come back and feed I thought her. YouTube raised their kids now. In an ideal world, they would. <laughs> Gotcha. Well, get YouTube premium. They're better parents. Um, <laughs> but anyways, you, but seriously, you two really are an amazing couple with three beautiful children and have accomplished quite a lot at, at your young ages. Like I said, I thought you were even younger than you were, but you're, you're a ripe young 40 years old and have done a ton in your career. And so let me give the, uh, the listeners a little background on you, Anthony. So he is right now the deputy director of surgery at Fort Belvoir Hospital in Quantico, Virginia, performing chief trauma and general surgery. He's also served our great country as an army surgeon overseas in both Kuwait and Afghanistan. And also, he is a huge UVA fan and Redskins fan. <laughs> he could not be happier with the current direction of the Washington football team. Is that right? Uh, that is absolutely incorrect, but I'll let you go on. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. Anthony <laughs> is from originally Bronx, New York, and naturally a Giants fan. And also, he did ROTC at William & Mary. Go so tribe. he's yeah exactly. So he's not the world's biggest uh, stuffy, as you might call us, Wahoo fan. Um, but I'll not. I won't hold it against you. Um, <laughs> he did, however, back our World Series champion Washington Nationals. Go Nets! Um, since his Yankees were already knocked out, he kind of had to. Uh, didn't want to you know take off his family too much. So we'll give him credit for that. Um, but enough about sports. Let's dive in here. And again, thank you so much for your service. And absolutely. Hua. Hua. <laughs> See, that's how you do it the right way. All right, so tell us a little bit about your, your family upbringing, your parents and siblings, and then I know you grew up, um, you are born in the Bronx, but then moved down to Chesterfield, Virginia um, as a 10-year-old child. Tell us a little bit about that. So um, uh, my background is that my parents are both Caribbean. Uh, my mother's Puerto Rican, my father's from Trinidad. Um, so I'm African-American, but from Caribbean descent. Um, the soccer team that beat the United States. That is right. Yeah. That was a very glorious. I, I, Trinidad shut down literally for a month. <laughs> so it was nice. it was a very glorious uh, time down there. I wasn't there. I've been a couple times. If you ever uh, want to see a good carnival, you go to Trinidad in uh, February. Shuts down every year for a month um, leading into uh, carnival season. I check my calendar. Yeah, it's, it's an experience. Um, but uh yeah, so my, my parents are Caribbean, so I grew up uh, Caribbean-American, African-American, and we uh, we lived in New York. I was born in the Bronx, uh, grew up in Peekskill, New York, so we moved to upstate when I was about four or five years old, and then from there, uh, we moved to Virginia. So I've been in Virginia since I was 10 years old, so I consider myself from Virginia at this point, because if you ask me, you know, where some places in New York, I I would Google it, just like every other uh, person in the world. Um, so I consider myself from Virginia, uh, grew up, I'm one of four siblings, I have a younger brother, two older sisters, um, very hardworking, dedicated parents. So I grew up in a two parent household that loved their kids and created uh, family ties and family bonds, which I try and em emulate in my own family. And then from there, uh, decided at a very young age that I wanted to become a physician and Kind of went down that path with um, my when did you choices. When did you know that you wanted to be a doctor? So I was like one of those other kids. Like you ask any child that's like seven or eight, they want to be a policeman, fireman, doctor, you know, a lawyer. Um, 
in our culture, we're like uh, very focused in on education. My parents were like, you know, if you do anything in this world, you're going to have a solid education. Um, so uh, I decided actually when I was a kid that I was going to be a doctor and nothing else was like first. So I've been through a lot of iterations of what type of doctor I was going to be. When I was in high school, I thought I was going to be a pediatrician. Towards the t- tail end of high school, I wanted to be the New York Football Giants uh, team physician. So I wanted to become. That's still on the table, by the way. It still is, but I'm too old for that. So um, I wanted to be a team physician. So I thought about orthopedic surgery. Um, I love kids, and so I thought about being a um, uh, OBGYN that delivers babies. And each career path, I've kind of either found pros and cons that kind of suited my personality. Um, and so I ended up uh, going into general surgery and then joining the military. Not in that order, but Gotcha. So, yeah, you, did, you you enrolled in the ROTC program mm-hmm. at William & Mary as a Virginia kid. Which is um, besides the best undergraduate program in the state of Virginia, by the way. Gotcha. You hear that, William & Mary? All right. The uh, best undergraduate program <laughs> in the state of Virginia. I'll, I'll just quickly move on. <laughs> um, so did you jo- join ROTC just because you hate sleeping in? Uh, no, like I joined ROTC. All right, so some more background. So when I was in high school, um, I went to Manchester High School in Chesterfield. And so I originally wanted to go to Maryland, um, Maryland College Park. I don't know why. Even now, Juan, I don't know Juan why. Dixon and Chris Wilcox might have had something to do they with were, that. They were actually after me. I'm older than them. I keep forgetting. Yeah. So <laughs> they were after me. Um, but I wanted to go to Maryland. Like I wanted, in my mind at that time, 16 to 18 years old, I wanted a big school experience. Um, Chesterfield is not that glamorous. Chesterfield is not that is much Chesterfield fun. near Richmond? Chesterfield is 30 minutes outside the city. And at the time that I actually grew up in Richmond, the city was very dangerous. So it wasn't like I was hanging out downtown um, Richmond, like you can do in DC. So the street life or family life or city life was not something that was like available to me at 16 years old. So Maryland seemed like a safe, fun, big college town. So that's how I ended up deciding out of like the thin air that I wanted to go to Maryland College Park. Um, that didn't really work out because I was out of state and I got scholarships, but it wasn't enough money. I'm from a you know, family that had four kids, so it was going to be expensive sending four kids to school, especially one out of state, especially when you have great schools like UVA, William & Mary, Virginia Tech, in Virginia, and you're a resident. So it made sense to select a Virginia-based school. Um, so fast forward, I wanted to go to Maryland, um, got into Maryland. They didn't offer me enough scholarship money. Um, and even with the scholarship money, William & Mary made more sense um, because it was still more cost-effective for me and my family. And then um, fast forward even further, when I was at William Mary, again, I'm one of four kids. We're all about two years apart. So that means that at any given point in time, there was three of us in school, either one finishing, one in the middle, one at the beginning. So it became pretty expensive for my parents. So I decided that I would be the one martyr that would go into the military and um, do military service because I should have gotten a scholarship out of high school, but I kind of bs for lack of a better description, because I was like, Maryland's going to give me a full ride. And they didn't. And right. then I missed deadlines, and so I was a little bit behind the curve. Gotcha. Okay, awesome. And then you went to VCU, sticking with the Virginia, another great Virginia school for medical school, and then finished your residency at um, Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. And that's where, because they had merged at that point with U.S. Naval hospital, correct? And that's where you met your lovely wife, Regina, right? Yeah. So it was Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Um, The institute is different. Um, And then they did merge. So in 90s, they bracked, which is um, reassignment of military facilities. And so they merged with the Navy, um, the National um, Naval Medical Hospital. So that became the new Walter Reed, essentially. Um, And my wife, my, my wife, was at Walter Reed in 2006 when I started there. And we didn't start dating until 2010. What took so long, huh? Uh, <laughs> you know, like wooing, courting. Right. Um, so it just took a little bit of time to... She was playing hard to get, huh? Yeah, she was playing hard to get. Um, you know, and, and again, I was busy with training and residency. And so I think mentally I was unavailable. Good thing, same uh, time, right? Yeah, she, she's like wine. <laughs> so um, I just needed to let her age and ripe, and uh, and then we started dating in 2010. Okay, awesome. So 
tell me about your experience at Walter Reed. Last time we talked about it, you were telling me one of the first things that stuck out was how there were so many other young men, you know, uh, around your age getting treated for very serious injuries, dealing with a lot of mental anguish. So tell me about your experience there. Cause you were there for what, six years. So I was there for six years. So yeah. the, so the most, um, devastating, well, one of the most devastating cause there's Pearl Harbor as well. Um, stateside attack was 9-11. So 2001, um, I was in and around medical school, medical school time then. And so fast forward from that aspect, I was ROTC committed to the military. Um, 2006, once I completed medical school, I started my training. So we were at the verge of the first surge um, and really the height of the war between 2006 to 2012. So that's when I trained at Walter Reed. Um, so at that time, um, old now, but I was young then. So graduating medical school, I was probably around 25 to 27 age range. So taking care of a lot of the soldiers that we would get back, it was a lot of young, young men and women, um, in the age range from really as young as 18, um, old enough to enlist to 25. Um, so I felt like they were my peer group. Um, and a lot of their story I resonated with because, my parents were Caribbean. We came from a, a good household, um, but we weren't rich. We weren't poor. So a lot of middle class, uh, in a lot of instances for enlisted um, in the military, it was a little bit of uh, like rural communities that were being represented by that population. And so people that I directly went to school with or I felt like I was. So as a young 20-year-old person, I had a lot of struggles with taking care of people that I could see myself in. Um, and it was hard because the injuries that we were seeing, we had never seen in war. Um, what, what uh, so multi-level amputees. So World War II, World War I, you saw a lot of amputees from explosions, what have you. Um, but the type of penetrating trauma, the, the traumatic brain injury, um, the multi-level trauma, so not just single extremity amputees, but two, three, four level amputees. Um, we were seeing coming back regularly. And so you would look at them, and in my instance, going through that training, I would see a lot of myself in them. Or I'd see my younger brother, who's only two years younger than myself, and I would see him um, in those people um, that I was caring for. So it was just a lot of like physical, emotional, and environmental stress that I kind of underwent during that training, but it made me a, a better clinician. It also made me more focus in on what I was trying to accomplish. Right. And then <clears throat> six years there, I mean, you've experienced a lot. And so I'm mm -hmm. guessing that really helped prepare you for when you finally got the gig at, at Fort Belvoir. Yeah. So six years of training, um, there's a lot of different training. Um, so there's a direct hospital where you're seeing all this injury after it's actually happened. So not point of contact injury. Um, and then we spent a lot of time at local hospital centers. So I trained at Washington. Um, Just by point of contact injury, you mean injury right next to the battlefield correct. where it actually happens, right? Yeah, battlefield yeah. injuries. Okay. Um, so there's no way to really uh, replicate battlefield injuries. The best that we can do stateside when you're training surgical or training surgeons um, that we call surgical residents, you send them to local trauma centers that do high volume. So Washington Hospital Center was one of the hospitals. I, um, a lot of my training that I hold dear to my heart came from shock trauma which is the Maryland um, Trauma Center, Level 1 Maryland Trauma Center. Um, and you learn how to care for these folks. But when you're in a deployed environment, the environment's different and the ability is different as far as the care for folks. But from simplicity's sake, like stopping bleeding and caring and moving the patient on is what allows you to kind of save lives and push people forward. Right, because... <clears throat> because overseas in, in, in battles, you don't have as many resources. Is that what you're saying? No, it's uh, – I literally – my first deployment, um, and we can get into this at any point in time, but just a quick note on my first deployment. I graduated in August, um, September from my basic training course because I was a, a late basic training guy. Um, we take our national boards, and then I deployed in January. So, you know, in less than six months, I was in a war zone. And when I was in a war zone, I was actually in charge of a 15-person remote unit that was responsible for a 50 nautical mile area to receive all injured folks, either local nationals, Afghan army, our own regular army, or special forces, special operations command um, in that region. So it was amazingly humbling. Um very intimidating on my first tour and 
mind blowing to say the least, because in the United States, when you get somebody injured, you have a lot of technology at your disposal. When you're in a deployed setting and you're literally in a tent. Um, hey, let me let me uh, let me just uh, rewind a little bit here. So mm-hmm. after <clears throat> after Walter Reed, you get the job at Fel- Fort Belvoir and then Correct. you're deployed within three months. And so how did that go? You got deployed. How did you feel that first day getting sent overseas? Um, well, there was a whole process to getting overseas. Um, but the first day, like in country. Yeah. Oh man. Traveling overseas. How did oh, you traveling feel? overseas. It was, it was, uh, interesting and it was humbling. Um, but it was terrible. Um, interesting and humbling because it's amazing how the United States deploys people, uh, to places that they have no idea where they're going. Um, and the logistical, like, bear that it takes to actually get people into a foreign country safely is humbling. So I felt very safe and secure getting over there. And then you're in a war zone. You're literally in an active war zone where people are trying to shoot you. People are trying to shoot down your helicopters and planes and people are trying to mortar and and drop bombs on you every day. And this was not a conventional war fighting enemy. Um, you talking about in Af- Afghanistan? In Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. I w- I've been in uh, three tours in Afghanistan. So there, it's more like guerrilla warfare, um, submersion type of warfare. So it's not like, you know, you see who the bad guys are. It, it, it's a lot more um, mental warfare as well, even for our war fighters that are on the f- mm-hmm. uh, front front lines. But for me, like stepping into country, it was amazingly like thinking that I may never go home again. Um, but you kind of, for me as what my job was, I pushed that to the side and then I really just focused in on what my training had set me up to do and then prepared on taking care of injured people. How hard is it to compartmentalize when you're over there to like, just be like, this is my job. This is my duty versus thinking about your, your wife and your kids and your family and all that. So it's, um, for me in particular, uh, I feel like a lot of people have a hard time compartmentalizing. Um, and it manifests in different ways. For me, I think that one of my, if you call it a skill set, um, is my ability to compartmentalize. Um, That's definitely a skill set. So, and, well, yeah, thank you. Um, but I, I do. Like, I have a very, like, keen ability to compartmentalize. So that way I'm not distracted. Like, I love my wife and family, and they're the most important thing in my world, even deployed. But I can't focus on what is going on back home, per se, um, when I'm spending, you know, 100% of the time downrange trying to take care of other people's families that are in harm's way. Um, and my I wife... Think, I don't think anybody wants a surgeon that isn't good at compartmentalizing. Yeah. That's one of the biggest parts, right? Yeah. It's hard to do. You do. You have to... Because there's an emotional barrier that you have to have in order for you to have empathy for your patients. But you also have to have a level of emotional understanding that there's certain things you can and cannot control. Um, and especially dealing with trauma and dealing with patients that um, can die, you have to accept that as long as you do your best and you're prepared. And that's what I focus in on for me personally. I'm always trying to be as prepared as possible. And that way I can execute what I need to execute and do uh, what I need to do to save lives. And I know even in the best circumstances, somebody may die. Um, Thank goodness I haven't had a lot of those issues over the course of my career. Um, But, you know, that is still a possibility. But I have to accept that before I even go into it. Otherwise, I'll be distracted by not allowing somebody to die. Right. Um, So I don't know if that answers your question fully, but that's kind of like the best way I can wrap my mind around it. So for us that have no experience in this type of Mm -hmm. thing, tell us about where you were stationed and, you know, what was like the height of the conflict when you were over there for the first time? So um, height of the conflict. So I was stationed at Fort Belvoir, wh- where Fort Belvoir is um, is a military hospital. It's considered a community hospital, so a hundred bed or so hospital um, that does a lot of a lot uh, outpatient elective surgery, um, simple cancer based surgery. It's one of the busier hospitals in the military army side hospital system. Um, so that's where I was stationed for my day to day practice. When I deploy, we don't do any elective surgery. You actually fall back on your training and maybe some additional work that you do stateside in order to provide acute care surgery and trauma surgery. So when when I leave, like you know, I can be the world's best you know left hernia guy, but when I deploy, I'm I need to be the world's best trauma surgeon and acute care surgery guy. Um, as by, a gen- by, mm-hmm. by acute care, you mean something very specific, right? So by acute care, I mean like you come in and you're sick 
and you need a surgery within the next 24 to 48 hours to save your life. Um, or, you know, like extend your life or stabilize your life. With trauma, it means that you have gotten shot, blown up, stabbed, or injured, and you might die within a period of minutes to hours. And I have to make very sound and and strategic decisions in order to stop you from dying by right. the time and you the meet Number me. one thing is stop the bleeding, right? Yeah, number one thing is always stop the bleeding. Um, if you can stop the bleeding, you buy yourself time. Okay. Um, the, so the movies are not wrong in that regard. Yeah, no, the movies are not wrong. That, right. They got that one right. That's the only thing probably, but yeah. Um, but if you see this new like uh, nursing or, or chest tube um, video that's floating around the internet, that is grossly wrong. But I have not, but yeah. yeah. Well, you've got three yeah. kids at home watching YouTube, so yeah, that's <laughs> you, true. you see it all. Yeah. So what, what were the most challenging war injuries to treat? I know you mentioned there was a lot of blast and mortar injuries, mm-hmm. you know, because it's more guerrilla warfare style, just, mm-hmm. you know, air bombs and that type of thing. And, and well, not air bombs, it's IEDs. So they actually literally use like fertilizer and manure, um, for fertilizer um, based products to create explosions. And you can actually get enough like um, products to make a 20 pound bomb. And those bombs are devastating enough to blow up um, with, what we call, with just fertilizer? Yeah, with just fertilizer. Like they're... Really? Yeah. And remote control, like um, batteries and um, two-way radios to set them off. Um, the old school Nokia push phones. Right. And so they'd remote detonate these things. And I mean, they would completely destroy uh, completely destroy MRAPs, so up armored vehicles. Um, so, so a lot of it's penetrating trauma, um, penetrating from random things. It could be you know, a piece of the vehicle cutting through someone's neck. Um, so the most challenging um, and uh, mentally humbling injury I, was actually a blast injury, someone driving, and they rolled over an, I, an improvised explosive device that was designed for a convoy that had not yet come. Um, so it was an inadvertent one. It was an inadvertent. Um, and it actually destroyed the whole, like, front side anterior aspect of the person's throat and neck. Um, so, you know, the patient shows up and, and I had never until this point in time, um, and just to give you context, I had seen a lot of trauma. I graduated on time, you know, taking care of a lot of injured patients between DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, and through all of those years and thousands of patients, I had never seen this injury before. Um, the patient was otherwise stable. So, you know, you break things down into sick, not sick, dying or not dying. Um, and then you react. Um, But it was actually one of the most devastating injuries I had seen. And so between the orthopedic surgeon and myself, we figured out what was the most important things to one, save this person's life, and then make sure in four to six weeks that that patient can feed themselves and take care of themselves. And then we just slowly started plugging away. And when we got to a point where um, the patient was clinically stable, meaning that their vital signs were no longer trying to have them leave this earth, I actually called um, one of my ENT colleagues um, to make sure that for the head and neck things that we were doing, because now we were in a stable zone that we weren't missing something because right. I knew that the next patient or the next person that was going to care for him may or may not have the clinical know-how to take care of them. Um, and so that was honestly the first, and that was like my first operation in country. Um, so it that was your really, first operation? First operation in country, first tour, 2013. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty- Um, after that, all the other operations were as expected for me. So penetrating trauma to the abdomen, somebody bleeding out, you know, chest trauma to the, to the chest, you know, and patients not doing well. For me, it was stuff that I had seen. (laughs) Um, so I felt very comfortable getting into the chest, getting, um, control of the bleeding, stopping the bleeding and then buying myself time. There's been times where I've actually stopped bleeding and I've said, all right, we have bleeding under control. So now I'm gonna take a break. I'll be right back. Right. Now you can go have yeah. a water and a coffee and regroup. Right? And, you know, you're right. maybe not doing water and coffee, but for me as a surgeon, um, I'll take time to just think down what are the injuries? What are the things that I may be missing? What are the things that I need to look for? Um, because I have time. Like the most valuable thing in life is actually time. And when you're making decisions that are split second decisions to save someone's life, in my purview as a surgeon, when I, when I get myself time, it could be two minutes. I make a lot of clinical decisions that will impact that patient's outcome within those two minutes. And so I need that time. Um, and yeah, I, and no, no pressure. Yeah, I right. mean, no pressure at all. Right. Um, so I need that time. So I take that time, and, and then I get back into it. And I've been deployed with really good 
nurse anesthetists, anesthesiologists, um, orthopedic surgeons that have made that decision tree easier for me. Um, but it is, it's a little, it's a little humbling, a little stressing. Um, and it lives with you even beyond those days. Yeah, I'm sure. And, uh, this is not the most fun question to ask, but what was, would you say you've done three tours in Afghanistan, Mm -hmm. right? If you had to pick one, what was your worst day out there? So, um, the worst day is when a patient dies. So I had, you know, luckily enough for me, I haven't had a lot of, um, people that have been, um, that have been brought to me and my team at point of injury and then expire. Um, and so I think the hardest time was, you know, we had a patient, they came in an extremis, meaning that they came in pretty much, um, almost terminal, almost terminal. Um, every injury can be terminal, but they were, we did a really good job of, of bringing this patient back. Um, everyone's body has a, set point where, you know, despite the best hands and the most talent in the world, you know, your body just can't take the injury. Control what you can control, right? Yeah. Um, both in life and both in practice. Um, and so the patient was in a stable scenario where they were going along, but I think the level of injury was just too much that when we went to move the patient and transfer him, the patient ended up having a terminal event. Um, so that, that was the worst day because, like, you know, I still remember, you know, the six to eight hours that happened before, after, and during. Um, and that always lives with you. Um, Cause you do you think, well, we'll cut it, could have, would have, should have? Oh, right? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You always go back and, you know, and you'll even chart dissect. And then um, both in war, both in stateside, you'll present it amongst your peers. And because sometimes fresh eyes will help you see what you didn't see. Um, and in the end, everything was done that was appropriate, which gets back to my original statement earlier is that you always want to be prepared because you have to also accept that bad outcomes are not, or outcomes you don't want are still an expected outcome. If someone gets shot in something and they're bleeding out, they may die. Um, and so it's always a very humbling event when it happens, even when you perform in the best fashion that you absolutely can. So um, those are things that kind of live with you. Well, you, you've said the word humbling quite a few times, and I think that's what it takes to be a doctor, a good doctor. Is, I think it's what it takes to be a good human being. True. Yeah, and I think that's why what makes a good doctor is somebody that's, that cares about every single person that's in front of them and does whatever they can to control the outcome. That, that's really interesting to hear your perspective. And you talked about it already, but what, what, the, what did you do just besides being naturally able to compartmentalize, which a lot of mm-hmm. people are not? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what what were you able to do to keep a level head and keep your emotions in check while you're doing these life saving you know surgeries and treatments and all these wounded warriors? Well, the biggest thing that I always focus on is that, especially when you're doing these, is that if I'm out of control, then that sets the stage for the rest of the room. So if I, as a surgeon, am sitting there throwing stuff and you know, yelling at people and creating a hostile environment, so if I'm sitting here frustrated and your job is to hand me instruments so I can work well, and maybe the instrument that I want you don't have, I can't sit here and yell at you um, and kind of berate you and throw stuff at you because it's going to make you tense. It's contagious, right? It is, and so it's infectious. So if me as a surgeon, um, I have a bad temperament, and I'm getting on you, getting on you, you as a, a person that's supposed to support taking care of that patient, is going to be apprehensive because the last thing you want to do is make a mistake and then hear, oh, you know, some type of berating. So everyone, you know, the one thing that I try and always focus in on is that everybody has a purpose and everyone has a sensitivity level. And and they also don't have your level of experience. It's inappropriate for me to expect, like, either my nurse or my scrub tech or even my first assistant who may be an orthopedic surgeon um, to have the same level of, like, angst and focus as me, but my job is that they're there to assist me. So if I can't communicate well with them, I can't get them on board with understanding what they need to understand. And if I can't see things through their lens, then the patient is going to suffer. Um, so I always really focus on, even in like bad times, making sure that everybody is mellow and cool because as soon as someone gets uptight, 
as soon as someone gets um, anxious in a deployed setting, they're going to make a mistake because right. they're so worried yeah, about, right. yeah, they're going to be so worried about making a mistake that it, I see it happen more times than not. So right. I've learned to kind of create you have to, a to form your vest. You could be a doctor, uh, an athlete, or a musician, or anything. You have to be calm. You do to perform at your best. Yep. You have to have your blood pressure in check. That's yeah. that's great. And I did a little bit of research on a lot of the stuff you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I kept coming across was what was called damage control surgery. Oh yeah. Please elaborate on this. The most I guess it's the most modern and technological advancements in military trauma. I guess they've mm-hmm. helped a lot. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that have come out of this war. So every war has um, advanced medical care. World War One, World War Two, we learned about amputees. We learned about infection, penicillin, antibiotics. Um, we learned um, through this war um, about again amputees that you can now go run miles and run marathons and yeah, you and see, live I, normal I see lives. Them at the five Ks in DC. Yeah, well, you see them often, and they, have, and they have good good runs too. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, so there's a lot of positive that comes out of wars, and that's the end result of patients being cared for. Um, this act, this war actually in particular has the highest save rate. So if people become injured and they get to point of care injury, like the, like where I am or my equivalents or my partners, uh, my peers are, they have a greater than 95% save rate for all injuries. That's crazy. So it's amazing. Compared that's like, like Vietnam or something. I mean, well, I can't it's imagine. amazing yeah. how much, how many lives you save. Um, um, but on the flip side, um, it's also amazing when you look at how many you save, how many you impact. So this is also one of the wars where we have the most injured um, folks that are now dealing with what is life after injury. So we're balancing that out as well with the amputees and with the PTSD and and with the experiences. Yeah, because the the mental part goes with it. And people that lose their limbs, they also have the the ghost limb feeling. Correct. You know, there's a lot of problems that, that lead to it. And as you know, depression and suicide are problems. So how do we deal with all of that? It's, right. it's like a new problem that's, it's almost, you don't want to say it's a good problem because it means they're still alive, mm-hmm. but I know exactly what you mean. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's a different um, problem. It's a new problem. It's a, it's a new problem. And are we prepared to, to deal with it or are we reacting to it? But to, um, you know, the original question as far as damage control surgery, damage control surgery also came out of this, this um, theory and when you look back on the commentary where I said I needed two minutes, you know, I try and control things so I can give myself two minutes. That's what damage control surgery is. So you get a patient that's injured, broken, whatever. You make sure that you have taken care of bleeding, stop bleeding, put a finger on it, put a suture in it, packed it. So that way bleeding stops. If you stop bleeding, blood will go where it's supposed to. Um, and if blood goes where it's supposed to, the heart, brain, and vital organs will live and then you have time. So if you stop bleeding, it gives you the gift and grants you the gift of time. And when you have time, it allows you to say, all right, you know what, we've stopped bleeding and now we can move this patient to someplace else where they may have more resources um, and they can have different surgeons and what have you and they can take better care of this patient from a multi-system, multiple injury um, type of scenario where that patient will have better outcomes. Okay. So that's what damage control surgery is. The simplest concept to think of is that patient comes in broken. You you don't fix broken, but you stop broken from getting worse, becoming more broken, and then you move that patient along to the next surgeon and surgical team that can care for him. Okay, very interesting. Um, so if you could change, and uh, like I said, uh, your opinion is not uh, indicative of the opinions of the U.S. military. That's right. Um, <laughs> legal liability, asterisk, asterisk. That's uh, right. Barry Bonds does not have the home run record. Um, if you could change one thing about the military's uh, current trauma procedures and surgeries, what would it be? Stateside or deployed? Because there's two militaries. Let's talk about st- deployed. Deployed? Mm-hmm. Um, so just making sure that the the – um, surgeons are and surgeons and surgical teams are adequately resourced. So, what the military and or what organizations, because um, my views and opinions do not reflect the uh, opinions of the United States <laughs> military, um, but what organizations do, um, it, they may fall victim to not understanding what happens at point of injury. So what I always, I I try and make things as simple as possible. 
And so what I am in the business of when I'm deployed as a trauma, critical care, expeditionary surgeon, person that's supposed to stop bleeding, what I am in the business of is stopping bleeding on 100% of the people that come to me. So there's two types of wars that are fought. The war that's fought like in the politics and the war that is fought um, on the ground with people. So when you're dealing with people, and if people make it to me, and there's also th rules of engagements and people that qualify for care and all that other stuff. Um, but when it comes to people that come to me, me as a surgeon, 100% of the people that I see, I'm going to try and save their life, which means that their life has value because they made it through our system. And so our system needs to make sure that the surgeons and the, and the, and the care teams that are there for a reason have all the resources that they need to save that person's life. And then that they can be resourced again, get more supplies. Um, because again, I've been in the middle of Helmand province. And if for reference, it's in the middle of the worst place that you can imagine. For the, American, uh, the seventh layer of hell, so to speak. You know, I won't characterize it as such because, right. again, my opinions do not reflect those of the United States military. It's not a safe place to be. I'll put it that it's way. It's not a safe place to be. That's okay. the best way yeah. um, to put it. Right. Um, but if it's not a safe place to be, it's also not a safe place to get resources into. Right. And it's also not a safe place to get assets out of. So you have to consider that in your logistical moves. And if you have a team that's out there to save lives, you have to also think about, well, how are we going to get stuff to them to do their job and also get the patients that are now injured out of there? Um, so so did they create like a safe route where there was, there was, I mean, how did that work? Yeah, we, we th this is me being sarcastic. Yeah, we call the, the local enemy, and I won't name them, we call the local enemy, be like, hey, we're going to fly injured people, both yours and ours, on this route, don't shoot us. That doesn't happen. Right. They, um, they probably know all your routes. In. Yeah, I mean, because we're very predictable. Um, because we're the only people that adhere to the Geneva Convention. And again, my opinions are my own. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of people don't. We we fight civilized warfare, and, and sometimes the enemies in which we fight don't fight civilized warfare. So you're at a disadvantage. Not a disadvantage. You're just... Because, again, I don't... I honestly... All right, so another bias. I've been deployed three times, been in very bad places, and I felt safer in my war zones than I've felt in uh, certain places in the United States. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, you can you can dive into that if you want. But what I'm saying is is that we do a good job of getting um, Americans and troops and war fighters into dangerous situations, and we do an even better job of getting them out safely. And it also feeds into your ability to go and do your job. And I use this as an analogy to, you know, your listeners and everyone in general. If you worry about getting shot and not cared for, that means you worry about dying. But if you know that if you get shot or injured, somebody's going to take care of you and you have a high chance of living, it's going to make you perform better as a warfighter. Um, and so our service members know that if they get injured, one, we're never going to leave any person behind. Uh, we will exhaust every option to make sure that Tim comes home, Anthony comes home. So I have confidence in that. So if I know if I'm out doing a remote mission and I get shot and I'm on the side of a hill, they're going to send hell and high water to come get me. And so whether I live or die, I know that I will be home. Um, so it allows me to go forward That's and, awesome. and function appropriately. And so it's a different war that Americans fight when they deploy versus some of our counterparts because they're not guaranteed that. No. That privilege. No, not at all. So. Well, that's very interesting. Um, so tell me, what would you give a young aspiring military doctor like yourself, but rewind the clock to back when you mm -hmm. were you know, 18 years old or so? What advice would you give them right now? So um, in your young career, just, just understand or pay more attention to people. Because in the end, like you can be as brilliant as you want to be. Um, doctors are in the business of taking care of people. And they're into discipline. I won't even say business because that's a stateside concept. Um, doctors should be in the discipline of taking care of people. Um, in America, we, we pay for services, and that's really where healthcare starts to get a little hazy. Um, but when I, as a purist, when I signed up, which is also why I love the military, um, I wanted to take care of people. And I still get to do that every day. Um, the only thing is, as I've got become officially old and gotten older, is that I want to take care of my family. 
And so the decisions that I make no longer only impact myself. They impact the people that are respons- that I'm responsible to, which is also my, my immediate family. Right, which is a, a great transition, which I wanted to ask you, which we haven't gotten to yet. Mm-hmm. I know Regina, unfortunately, couldn't join us. She's amazing. Wife. Amazing person. Hashtag great wife. Uh, probably maybe more amazing than you. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, leave that Hashtag up. Hashtag yes. We'll leave that up for debate. I think so. But what was that like for her? I mean, she's not here to speak for herself, but I'm yeah. sure she told you mm-hmm. um, on WhatsApp, like when I called you and when yeah. you were in Kuwait and it was yeah. 125 degrees oh, was and I looked on my phone in Arlington and it was also 125 degrees, but 95 with before the with heat the index. Heat, so yeah. you had, I was in the swamp, you're in the desert. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was a hilarious coincidence. Uh, but, but tell me what that was like for Regina and, and for the kids when you were gone three different times. And for one time you were gone, what, six months? Yeah. Um, so I've been gone a year and a half, a little over a year and a half total in the last five years um, with deployments. So for Regina, it's honestly the hardest thing. I feel like it's a lot harder than what I do. Um, I joke a lot, and this is going to be on my line of joking, but like, you know, whenever I deploy, I get in amazing shape because I work out all the time. Um, you know, I read a lot, which is great. Um, and I don't have to chase behind my own kids. So it's like, it's like a devilish, like, you know, great personal aspect. You deal with everything else. It's almost like you get to be in college again. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's You're like reading adults, and hanging out. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's great. Um, except you, you might die. Except for you might die. That's yeah. right. But you might <laughs> die in college too. You, <laughs> might, you know, you might die crossing the street. Um, so I always say that the hardest job is actually to the spouse, to the husband and the wife that stay home because life still happens. Like our American culture still happens at a million miles an hour. So when I'm deployed, you know, my entire day, I can give you my entire day. I wake up 4 in the morning, 4.30 in the morning. I call home to talk to my kids, talk to my wife. I go to the gym, you know, in the morning um, from 6 to whenever. Roger. And then we have a morning meeting. We train. Um, then there's lunch. And then we wait for because usually traumas happen either in the morning or in the evening. Um, so then we just kind of rest cycle, wait for trauma if it's going to happen play cards, do do really like community building type things between my teams. Um, and then we go to sleep. I got more sleep uh, because we're, we're fighting, and this is Afghanistan. They don't do a lot of fighting at night because they don't have the capability. We have night vision. We have satellites. We have all sorts of stuff that we can keep the fight going 24 hours. Um, they don't have that. So when the lights go down, war fighting goes it's down. It's like guerrilla warfare, like you said. It is. Yeah. So you're not having as much conflict. Um, so you get, you know, decent sleep on occasion, but when you have an up tempo where you have your own war fighters going out, they're doing night missions, that's when you get less sleep. So you really learn to, to find that balance, but that's my day, day in and day out. The only person I honestly have to worry about is myself. When I call home, I get a glimpse of reality where I have to really, you know, support my wife, talk to my kids, you know, try to internationally parent, um, but also try and stay out of the way, um, and grant all the support that I can but stay out of the way because my wife is dealing with... She's doing all the hard work. Yeah, she's doing right. all the heavy lifting. Um, and so that's the hard part. So I have to say that the hardest mission that um, a lot of our war fighters, our, our military service members have is actually the people that we leave here to take care of home while we're defending like you know everyone's freedom. Um, because that's easy because you're out there focused on your mission and you're focused on your peers and everyone out there is just focused on surviving, but life and culture doesn't stop living just because we're gone. Right. You've got one thing to focus on. She's got 30 million. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. So one other thing I wanted to ask you about, I, I didn't even know this until I looked at your LinkedIn profile. You got an MBA last year. Yeah, picked so, that up. <laughs> just casually got an just MBA casually. last year yeah. while raising uh, three kids and you know doing all, all of your stuff at Fort mm-hmm. Belvoir. How, how did you fit that into your schedule? Uh, it was very challenging, actually. Again, kudos, you don't high say. fives. Yeah, <laughs> kudos, high five to my wife. Um, I wish she was here. She would give her a bottle of champagne or something. I know. She needs yeah. like two bottles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Three, one but, for each kid. Yeah, one for each kid. So um, so bottom line is like kudos to her. I, I did. I went back. Um, and this gets into like my professional, uh, sorry, my professional understanding and my 10, 15, 20-year plan. So as a professional, you should have a 10, 15, 20-year plan. Um, if you don't, then you're doing your own life professional career wrong. All right, spinning wheels. Yeah, you are. You're not making progress. 
because the one thing that we're all guaranteed to do is age. And the one thing that we're all guaranteed to do is get old and we're all guaranteed to die. Those are things that are consistent. What you do between the beginning and the end defines like how you live. Um, so a friend of mine, Mr. Kevin Pope, great guy, um, actually encouraged me to go back and get my MBA. Um, and I did, and I spent two and a half years online um, getting my MBA. But my primary focus was understanding the business aspect of healthcare um, with my own personal focus on how to make it better. Because there is a lot of waste in our healthcare system, um, but you don't want to lose the focus on taking care of patients because we're in a very unique business. At the end of the day, your desire to pay or not pay, provide care or not provide care impacts someone's family, not just that person, someone's family. Um, so I wanted to be able to have those educated conversations based on my experience, based on what business people kind of look for. Um, so that way we can have a really good conversation and dialogue about how healthcare should drive um, as I get older. And uh, so uh, that's part of my five, 10 year plan. Like I would like to be involved in administration and making a process and a system better, um, more efficient for the payers, you know, of, of healthcare, but also um, efficient and safe and high quality for the receivers of healthcare and finding that balance. Uh, we are very privileged in the United States to be in the United States. So everything can't be about capital gains and everything can't be about like, you know, waste. We have to find that happy median. Um, and so that's, what I focused on during my MBA. And so um, I've applied it to my own clinical practice. I've applied it to the sections that I run. And it does, like I've decreased my own relative healthcare costs. I've decreased, increased the productivity for like my patients and the throughput through my small slice of the military pie. Um, so it was a very necessary educational degree that's completely changed Um Kind of how I practice medicine and how I view medicine. That's cool. Yeah, you're, just, you're sharpening the axe. Yeah. You're sharpening the scalpel, I should say. Uh, right? Scalpel axe. <laughs> gotcha. Well, I don't even know what to say. This has been more than fascinating. I don't think 99% of anybody listening can really relate to all of your experiences, but this will help a lot of young doctors. And the whole point of this podcast is to help young doctors that are either just graduating or just going into, into medicine Decide what really drives people. What really, mm -hmm. what really makes you feel like you're making a huge difference in the world, and you you are every day. And on a much lighter note, um, last time we had talked, you mentioned you're getting a new tattoo. Oh yeah. Let me ask you. Um, I recommended that you get the logo for my company, Medical Advisors Group. It's an amazing logo. You decided to go in a dire different direction. Why? Um, so I have. Uh, um, I guess I'm <laughs> technically young, old enough to, like, appreciate tattoos. Um, tattoos are still cool. I, well, I, I know because I don't have one. It's yeah. a Spartan Warrior. It's a Spartan Warrior. Yeah, tell me about that. So um, the most recent one is a uh, Spartan Warrior. And so for um, simplicity sakes, it's kind of like the 300 type of theme, that type of Spartan Warrior. Um, also with a war scene in the background, um, linking into other things that are very relevant and pertinent to me. So the Spartan warrior for me um, really embodies like hardship, struggle, um, but there's nothing that's more undying than the Spartan spirit. And so when you read about it, they, you know, you, you hear about them and they could be annihilated or what have you, but even down to the last person, they're going to give their, their last breath to make sure that family and Sparta were protected. Right. Um, and so that's really where the essence comes from for me. So I have a pretty great um, Spartan warrior by a great artist out of Fredericksburg. Um, and so it's in evolution, but it's also tied to my family because um, the rose is a very symbolic both in gladiator times you know they throw roses to the successor so there's a rose wins. on there on the yeah tattoo. it's roses as well and i have four of those because the most important thing to me is my family and it represents my wife and my kids right um and then i have a clock uh i actually have a hourglass because kind of what i alluded to the most important thing that we have that we waste a lot of times but we share with people is time um and and so that's all part of the theme. So I, I have very themed tattoos, and that's the running theme. Um, and the last part with the time aspect is that, you know, there's nothing greater that you can give somebody like, than your personal time because time is very valuable. And I think through my multiple deployments, what have you, and 
like granted, I've never been shot, but I've been in gunfights, not like like me pulling a trigger, but Squir- like been, squirt guns. Yeah. Okay. No, I've been in squirt <laughs> gun fights, but I've been legit. Water balloon fights. fights. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, it's very humbling knowing that, you know, this may be your last moment in time. So I've, I've learned to appreciate time and um, both time away, time to yourself and time with your family. They're all very important and then balancing it. So absolutely. Well, thank you for your time. This is, mm-hmm. this hasn't been an incredible conversation. Um, one last thing I wanted to kind of wrap up on yeah. here. You mentioned that uh, you and your wife, uh, Regina, are doing some new kind of, I guess this probably goes with your lifestyle brand about, you know, nutrition, the important nutrition, plant-based diets. Tell us, yeah. tell us about what you're doing there. Oh, so um, so kind of in the stateside medicine. So stateside, um, I actually do a lot of stuff in wellness. Um, I do metabolic surgery, weight loss surgery, um, what, what is metabolic surgery for the layman here? So the layman is, um, metabolic surgery is weight loss surgery. So um, people that are severely morbidly obese or struggle with weight gain, diabetes, weight loss issues, maybe. diabetes, diabetics, okay. bad um, hypertensive patients, people that are suffering um, because we have an epidemic in America um, where a third of the population are obese. Um, and it's expected that we'll be morbidly obese, which requires sur- or is better treated with surgery and by 2050. So long story short is that my wife and I are very ingrained in wellness. Um, I am a vegetarian, um, and I believe in, like, plant-based diet, plant-based nutrition. So I focus a lot of my effort in trying to improve the quality of life um, of patients. And with all of it, ironically enough, with all of my war-based efforts, I feel like you get a new lease on life by eating well, being well, um, and my patients that I focus on are morbidly obese and they're the best patients in the world because they lose the weight and they get on a good regimen through good, um, clinical like relationships and they, they get a second lease on life. They get a second opportunity to, um, live. And if you've never seen the world through being overweight or struggling with weight issues, um, there are a group of patients and people that are marginalized and they're marginalized by society. Um, and I think that it's more of a focus now because that population is growing, but it doesn't replace the effect on how they feel. And so with the whole weight loss, surgery, the nutrition focus that I have, even the plant-based lifestyle that I really I didn't know encourage. you were vegetarian. Oh, yeah, I'm vegetarian. I've been for vegetarian how long, for, like for how long? Three years. Okay, cool. Wait, two years. Two years. Two years. My wife actually started. Uh, Anthony, I don't know what to say, but uh, thank you so much. This has been awesome. It's been incredible talking to you. Your stories are fascinating beyond belief. So more than a uh, good time well spent. And then on top of the, all the stuff you've been doing, you just throw on an NBA casually there at the end. So yeah. keep up the good work. <laughs> keep up the good fight. You're an awesome representative of the United States of America, and it's been an awesome Thank pleasure you. to sit down with you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Cheers, my friend. <laughs>